Uh, last week, we were talking about simple harmonic motion where I said that it's actually a very specific kind of oscillation where there are actually two main characteristics to simple harmonic motion. So that time I mentioned to you that simple harmonic motion, the first thing that you will have to have is that the acceleration must be directly proportional to its displacement. And then the acceleration and displacement must always be acting in opposite directions. Okay, so that's what simple harmonic motion actually is, right? So the equation that will actually define to you what is actually simple harmonic motion is this one. A is equals to negative omega square x. This is actually known as the defining equation of SHM. Okay, so any equation that, sorry, any motion that follows simple harmonic motion must follow this particular equation. All right. Now, so when it, talk, when it comes to simple harmonic motion, we are also interested in a few things about it namely the displacement, the velocity, as well as the acceleration, okay? So we are interested in knowing how to calculate out the displacement of something that undergoes sensation, its velocity, and then its acceleration. Now, the first one we need to go through is how do we actually find out the displacement of something that undergoes simple harmonic motion? Now, before I can go to this one, you need to know a bit about uh, circular motion. Now, say for example, if I tell you right now, I have an object that is at point A. It is now trying to move in a circle in this direction, where it subsequently went to point B, point C, point D, E, and F. Okay, so during the time that this point is trying to move in a circle, I am interested in measuring the displacement of, of, of the points from a specific reference level. In my case, I want to pick this as my reference. Okay, this is the reference level that I'm actually interested in. This is the reference. So say for example, my object was at A. This one, I can say that my displacement is actually X equals to zero, all right? But when I have the object at position B, this one, it will be a displacement xb. When the object is at c, this one will be displacement xc. When it's at d, this is xd. And then when it is at e, this one will be xe. And then for f, this one will be xf, okay? Now, if you consider displacement as something, as a vector, there's usually a positive and negative associated with it, right? So if I assume that going upwards is positive, that would mean that the displacement that I'm seeing right over here for E and F is actually going to be negative in the first place, all right? So if I try to plot a graph of, say, displacement versus time, the object that moves in a circle will trace something that looks like this. This is the curve that you expect to see, okay? Where these points here, A, B, C, D, E, and F, represent the displacement at some particular time, okay? Now, we normally call this kind of graph shape as sinusoidal, and this is the general name of the graph, is sinusoidal. But I mean, when you look at this one, the first thing that will come to mind is that this one is actually a sine graph, isn't it? This one is called a sine graph. And now that you also learn called sine graph, which is something like this. This, sorry, this is not called sine graph. This is your cosine graph. And then you also have something like this sometimes. This one is your negative sine graph, isn't it? So all these graphs are known as sinusoidal graphs, okay? All these graphs that you see are known as sinusoidal graphs, okay? So it can be a sine graph, it can be a cosine graph, it can be a negative sine graph, it will still be known as sinusoidal graphs. Sinusoidal graphs are actually more like a general name, but more specific names to sinusoidal graph could be a sine, cos or negative sine graph, okay? So the thing that I just really want you to see from here is that 
when an object moves in a circle like this, its displacement from a particular point with respect to time tends to be sinusoidal. Okay, so one way in which you can easily see this is I will just play a video for you. Then you see from there, okay. Wait on, let me just share the video for you. Wait, is it? Um, just give me a minute. Okay, the video, where is it? Okay, so you are, you are seeing right now on your screen that some uh there's this point that is actually moving in a circle you know there's this thing here that is how i cannot draw it properly you will see that there's this point here that tends to move in a circle okay and then after that i'm trying to plot something like a graph of displacement versus time for it so you see, if I play the animation, this is what I expect to kind of see, okay? So that thing is actually moving in a circle, and then when it moves in a circle with respect to time, I measure the displacement from a particular point, in which in my case is that little horizontal line here, I'm going to get something like a sinusoidal graph with respect to time, okay? So that's just the main thing that I, I want you to see from here. If something moves in a circle, and you try to plot a displacement time graph for it, it will tend to be a sinusoidal graph. Okay, so how does this actually relate to your simple harmonic motion? Now, the thing that we will tell you is that something that moves in a circle is quite similar to something that moves with simple harmonic motion. Okay. So what we can say here is something like this. Now, just now I mentioned to you for a point that moves in a uniform circular motion, the variation of its displacement for a reference line with time is sinusoidal. Now, if say, for example, I want to compare the motion of something that moves in a circle with the motion of a pendulum ball that is undergoing SHM, there is something interesting that you will be able to see. So let's just say, for example, right now, I tell you that, you know, let me just uh so this one so let's say right now i see on the diagram that there are two objects two different systems the first one is my pendulum bob and then the other one is some sort of rod that is moving around in a circle like this and then my pendulum bob i know is swinging left and right like this okay so the thing that i want to do is that i want to shine some sort of light at the front so that i can actually see the shadow image of the rod on the screen behind and also the shadow image of the pendulum ball on the screen behind so if you just consider the motion of the shadow on the screen itself the pendulum ball will actually just move left and right like this. The rod, although it's moving in a circle, but if you're just viewing it right exactly at the front, your rod, the shadow image of the rod will actually just be moving left and right like this, okay? So the thing that people have found out is that when you go and look at the image of the rod, shadow image of the rod and the shadow image of the ball oscillating, their motion actually matches each other. Meaning you say, if the rod was here, the pendulum ball will be here. If the rod was here, the pendulum ball will be here. And then if the rod was here, the pendulum ball will also be at the same position. And so on, so forth. Okay, But this is provided that you do a few things in the first place, now, where you say that the swinging pendulum has amplitude equal to the radius of rotation of the rod. And then you adjust the speed of rotation of the turntable so that one revolution of the table is equal to the period of the pendulum itself. Okay. Then from there, you will want to see the shadow image on the screen. Okay. So I mentioned to you, if you do this, you will actually see that the swinging pendulum ball moves exactly as the shadow of the rod moving around the turntable. Now from here, is where we actually can get some sort of conclusion saying that the sim 
that saying that simple harmonic motion can actually be assumed to be a projection of uniform circular motion from which the displacement for equilibrium with time follows a sinusoidal curve. So you see, in my case, when I want to measure the displacement, last lesson I mentioned to you, displacement is always measured from equilibrium. So if you're talking about your equilibrium position, this line here would be your equilibrium. Okay, this line here would be your equilibrium. So your displacement will be measured either in this direction, you know, either in this direction or either in this direction. Okay, this is your displacement that you want to measure. And then you try to measure the displacement with respect to time and plot a graph. So you try to plot a graph, you will tend to see a sinusoidal curve. So earlier just now I mentioned to you that for circular motion, the displacement versus time graph would tend to be a sinusoidal graph, okay? But since circular motion now can be said to be the same as simple harmonic motion, you can also say that the displacement time graph would also be sinusoidal, okay? That's the main conclusion that you are supposed to know from here, okay? So there's actually an uh, animation that shows you that so I'm just going to play that uh, animation for you. Wait, uh, let me just find out where it is. It's not here. Okay, let me just play the animation for you. This one would be this one. Okay. Uh, I need to share with you this one. Okay, so now on your screen, you should be able to see some sort of animation where you see a green ball that's moving in a circle and then a red colored cylinder that is moving up and down. So this one here, you know, is circular motion. Then this one here is actually supposed to be doing simple harmonic motion. So I want you to look at the motion of the red cylinder and the green ball. You see the motion actually matches. Wherever the ball is, that is where you expect to see the red cylinder also. Okay, that's the reason why we say that simple harmonic motion can be equated to that of a circular motion. Okay. So that's the key takeoff point here. So let me just go back to the notes. Okay. So if I go back to the notes, if I already know that the motion, uh, the motion of the object underway SHM is sinusoidal for its displacement time graph, if I look at the graphs itself, the graphs, I know it's sinusoidal, but the shape can be varying depending on the starting position and your initial direction of motion. For example, if let's just say I have that uh, mass on spring, it's undergoing SHM. I told you that it was going from equilibrium position and then going upwards. You see that it starts from here, it goes up and then it goes down and then it goes back up again, right? So your displacement time graph ought to be a sine graph, okay? So you are starting from equilibrium. This is your equilibrium position, okay? So you go up, you go down, and then go back up again, you're going to get a sine graph. Now for this particular shape of your graph, there's an equation to represent the shape. This one we'll call this as x equals to x naught sine omega t. Okay, so this equation is something that is specific to this graph shape. I mean, you can see that this is a sine graph. Automatically, you can actually find out all oh, is x equals to x naught sine omega t. All right. Now, then after that, some other uh, different positions 
uh, motion that your mass on spring that the, your mass on the spring will go through could be that it started off from your top position and then it went down. So it started here, it went down and then it went back up again. And then bearing in mind that this one was again your equilibrium position. So by right, you're going to get a graph of cosine. Okay, you're going to get a cosine graph. So looking at this, this one, since it's a cosine graph, the equation that represents it is x equals to x naught cos omega t. All right. And the last one would be from bottom position going up, which is this one. So from bottom position going up, it starts from here, it goes up, and then it goes back down, right? So this one here being your equilibrium position, if you try to look at the graph, it will actually be starting from the bottom, going up, and then going down. This one, you know, is actually a negative cos graph. So it's x equals to negative x naught cos omega t. Okay, so it's from this equation here that you will actually be able to find out your displacement, provided you know a few other things now. What is your amplitude? What is your angular frequency? And then what is your time that you're considering? Okay, so if given a particular case where something undergoes SHM, and then they describe to you how it started moving, where did it start moving from, you will be able to find out what equation is describing the displacement of that object. And then from there, you can look on to solve certain things that the question asks. Okay, so this is for the displacement part of simple harmonic motion. But this part actually doesn't really come out that often in your passing exams. So this one is just good to know just in case. It actually just came out once or twice before in the very, very old past years. Now the one that is actually much, much more relevant to you is the one in the following page. Okay, so we talked about displacement before this. Now we want to talk about velocity and acceleration of an object that undergoes SHM. So in your case here, We again make use of the mass on spring system, and we again assume that it is undergoing simple harmonic motion. So right now, your mass is being displaced. You release it, and it's oscillating up and down. So it will go through three different points of interest. The first one is probably your equilibrium position, followed by your top position, and then your bottom position, okay? So these are the three points of interest when your object is actually oscillating with SHM. Now, what we will tell you is that when your object goes through these three different points, that is where either your velocity or acceleration will be maximum or zero, okay? So let's just go with the equilibrium position. Sorry, no, let's just go with the top position first. Now at the top position, generally speaking, we will say that your velocity is zero because your mass will have to stop momentarily before switching directions. Because you see, you can imagine that your object actually went up and then after that, it had to turn down, right? So this point here is kind of like a stationary point where v is zero okay so that's why here we consider your velocity as zero now the same could also be said for the bottom position okay because as your object continues to move down as your object continues to move down and then it, it wants to go back up again this part here is also another stationary point okay so here will also be where velocity is zero that's why here at the bottom position we can also say the velocity is zero okay now so in the amplitude position at the top and bottom is where you're having zero velocity there will be some point where your velocity must be maximum then your velocity is actually maximum at the 
equilibrium position. Okay, your velocity is always maximum at the equilibrium position. And bear in mind that when your velocity is maximum at the equilibrium position, it can actually be in two different directions. Because you just uh, try to look at the display, the motion of the mass as it oscillates. So it started here, it went up, it went down, it went down, then it went back up again before going back down again like this, right? So if I tell you that this one is your equilibrium, now at this point here, your object was actually moving down. Then after it went back down, it went back up, right? So now, right over here, your, your velocity is upwards, okay? So this one here is B max, but it's downwards. This part here is also V max, but it's upwards, okay? That's why I said to you that at equilibrium position, you would have maximum velocity, but it can be in two different directions. Either in your case, it's moving upwards or downwards, okay? So this is just talking about the velocity part. Now, what about the case where we, we are interested in the acceleration? Now, one of the things about simple harmonic motion that was mentioned earlier on for you was that simple harmonic motion has A directly proportional to X and A opposite direction to X, isn't it? So, the one that you want to make use of is A directly proportional to X. Because from here, you can actually see that if x increase, a must increase. If x drops, a must drop. And then here, you can actually kind of make some sort of conclusion. If x is max, a is max. Okay? Now, where a is max, this one, is referring to amplitude position, okay? Since acceleration is directly proportional to displacement, where displacement is maximum, you're going to get maximum acceleration. And where displacement is maximum, that is usually at the amplitude position, okay? So that's why here I can say this. The acceleration will always be maximum at the amplitude position because there the displacement is maximum. All right. Now at the same time, you can also kind of say something else from here. Because when x drops, a also drops, right? So if x is zero, a is zero. So here acceleration is zero at equilibrium since displacement here is zero. Okay. So this one actually makes use of the fact that. A is directly proportional to X, okay? So these are the points that you need to be aware of, all right? Now, if I really just want to find out the values of velocity and acceleration at a specific point, there are certain equations that you need to memorize. Okay, that one is actually listed in the table right above. If you are interested in finding the velocity V at the point, V is actually plus minus omega square root of x naught square minus x squared. Okay, there is no need for you to remember the derivation uh, for this. All you just need to know is that velocity at any point for something that undergoes SHM would actually be this equation here. Okay, and notice that there's a positive negative. The positive negative here is mainly meant to denote that your velocity can either be moved, can either be moving upwards or downwards here. If upwards is positive here, then negative must be downwards, no? okay? That's the reason why you have a positive negative there, okay? Now, from this equation here, you can actually then work out what is the equation for maximum velocity. Velocity is maximum when x is zero, okay? So just now I mentioned to you, at the equilibrium position, that's where your velocity is max. 
So you, you're just going to need to substitute x as 0 into this equation here. Okay. So the first equation here is telling you velocity at a point. But at the same time, you know that velocity is usually max when x is 0. We need to say you're at equilibrium position. So you just sub in x equals to 0 here. Your overall equation will simplify to x max equals to plus minus omega x naught. Okay. So if you just sub in 0 here, this one will just be square root x naught square. Then other than this one will again simplify to just x naught. No? So you're going to get omega x naught. Okay. So that is for velocity at the point and maximum velocity. Now, next one, if you want to find out acceleration e at any point, you just use the equation a equals to negative omega square x. This one, as I mentioned to you already, is actually the defining equation of simple harmonic motion. It will always tell you that acceleration is directly proportional to displacement, and the acceleration and displacement are always in opposite directions. Okay, so that's that. Now, if I want to find out the uh, an equation that tells me what is the maximum acceleration, all you just need to do is that you substitute x as x naught. Just now I mentioned to you at your top or bottom position, that's where your acceleration is max, right? Because that's where your displacement is max, right? So you just need to substitute displacement as amplitude. Substitute the displacement as the maximum displacement, which is your amplitude. So this one, you just substitute it as x naught. You're going to get a max as this or negative omega square x naught. Okay, so that's what you can see from here. All right, then another thing that you need to kind of be aware of is this. Now, generally speaking, you see these negative signs for the some of the equations that you're seeing, right? Let's just say for velocity, there's positive and negative, and then for acceleration, there's negative signs, right? So what I can mention here is that your negative sign is usually omitted during calculations of velocity and acceleration. Okay. When you do your partial questions later, as you look at the questions and they ask you to calculate the velocity and acceleration, you actually don't need to bother about the negative signs because they are actually only interested in the magnitude. Okay. For calculation questions, don't need to bother about the negative. But if your question is concerning graph plotting or definition questions, then you need to consider them, okay? When it comes to graph plotting or definition questions, you need to consider the negative sign right over there, okay? So that is for this. Okay, then you also would need to know how to plot certain graphs when it comes to simple harmonic motion. Now, the graphs that you will be plotting is velocity versus displacement and acceleration versus displacement. The ones that you used to plot was velocity versus time, but that is not the case right now. What you're interested in plotting right now is velocity and acceleration versus displacement. Okay, bear in mind it's not versus time here. Now, the simplest one to plot would be the graph for acceleration versus displacement. It can easily be deduced from your acceleration equation, where you say that A is equals to negative omega square x. You see that this one is actually similar to the, to the straight line, if you use your straight line equation. If you compare with the general equation of a straight line, you will see that A is actually y. And then x is actually x itself. Okay. Then your gradient is actually going to be negative omega square. There's not going to be any y intercept here. So if you were to plot a graph of say x versus, so you were to plot a graph of a versus x, you expect to see a straight line graph that passes through the origin with negative gradient. Okay. So this one, you expect to see a straight line graph 
true origin with negative gradient okay so that's what you're actually seeing right over here okay now certain points of interest would be where you have your maximum acceleration your maximum acceleration a max would be where you have negative amplitude your negative a max would be where you have positive amplitude okay this is the result of acceleration and displacement being opposite directions in the first place okay if one of them has one particular sign the other will have an opposing sign okay so this is your graph of acceleration versus displacement okay next one will be your velocity versus displacement graph now for your velocity versus displacement graph you might be thinking yeah i can probably refer to the velocity equation but you see your velocity equation here if you com try to compare it with the equation of a straight line it just doesn't work okay because this equation here clearly isn't similar to a straight line equation so you know that it's not going to be a straight line in the first place because you see you have a square to your x and then you square root it suddenly so this is not going to be a straight line so the easiest way to go about this is that what you can do is that you plot the points where v is max and zero okay so we already did this earlier where we we say that v is max when x is zero and then v is zero when x is at the amplitude so you can actually make use of this information and plot the four points okay so here when you are at equilibrium you have v max okay bear in mind that your v max can have two directions okay so your Vmax can have two directions, either upwards or downwards. That's why here at equilibrium is positive Vmax and negative Vmax. And then after that, at amplitude position, at positive negative amplitude position, your velocity is zero. Okay. So plot those four points, and then all you just need to do is to trace some sort of curve that connects all four points. Okay. Don't ever go and draw it like this where you connect it with straight lines so that it becomes something like a diamond shape you connect it like this this is actually wrong already okay so just draw a curve that connects all four points now depending on the scale of your graph sometimes the shape of that graph itself it can be a circle or an oval shape it depends on the graph scale that they've used okay then the next one uh sometimes your question will ask you how do you know something is going to be a simple harmonic motion just by looking at the graph okay certain questions that you see later will ask you how do you deduce that something is falling in simple harmonic motion just by the graph itself now the way to deduce whether something is simple harmonic motion is that you just look at the acceleration displacement graph if you see that your acceleration displacement graph has a straight line through origin it indicates that acceleration is directly proportional to displacement okay it meaning to say you get something like this right you see it's a straight line graph it is already implying to you that your acceleration is directly proportional to displacement okay and then after that the negative gradient of the graph usually tells you that negative and this uh, usually tells you that acceleration and displacement are in opposite directions okay so these are the two points 
that you will usually use when asked to describe why uh, when asked to deduce whether something is simple harmonic motion okay this one is deducing simple harmonic motion from graph okay so this one is okay then i move on to the next section okay now that we've gone through the displacement velocity and acceleration portions of simple harmonic motion we go on to the energy aspects of simple harmonic motion okay energy changes in simple harmonic motion so let's just consider the same mass on spring system that we have before but this time we go and mount it horizontally so the reason why we want to mount it horizontally is so that our gpe can actually be ignored just now when it was mounted vertically as the mass moves up and down there's actually gpe changes okay now we actually mount it horizontally so that we can actually ignore the GP because when it's oscillating horizontally like this, the mass actually doesn't move up and down. Okay, so the only energy that we can consider then is actually just between elastic potential energy of the spring and the kinetic energy of the mass. Okay, so let's just consider that you actually displace the mass at the amplitude position okay this is the amplitude position let me just kind of draw a line from here this is your positive amplitude this one is your negative amplitude so say right now you go and displace your object at the equilibrium position we know that if you displace it from the equilibrium position, it's just going to go towards the left and then go back towards the right and then go back towards the left and back and forth like this, right? And then this one here being your equilibrium position, okay? So let's consider the part when you first release the mass. Or let's just consider the part where your object was just starting off from the amplitude position. Over here, we consider your EPE to be max because displacement is maximum. Now, you remember the definition, the equation for elastic potential energy of a spring is actually half kx squared. So, EPE is proportional to x squared. So, if x is max, EPE is max. Okay. Right, so that's that. Okay, uh, generally just join in. Uh, hi, generally we are under page 10. All right. Okay, yeah, back to what I was talking about. When your object is moving from the amplitude position, your EP is max because your displacement is max. At the same time, your KE would also be zero because here I mentioned before, that is the point where your velocity is zero. Okay, so EP max, K, EP, e, EP is max, K is zero here. Now, when your object then moves on to your equilibrium position, which is this line here, your EP by right should be zero because displacement is zero, but your K is max because velocity is max. Okay, so I don't think I need to really talk about the K, but I think I just write it anyway. Uh, K E is half mv squared so ke is proportional to v squared so if v is max ke is max okay so this is an equilibrium where ep is zero k is max then when you go to the other amplitude position on the other end the same thing kind of happens again uh, like the first part EP is max because displacement is maximum, K is zero because velocity is zero. So after that, it goes back to equilibrium. It goes back to the amplitude position again. So whatever you see after that is actually a repetition of what you have earlier. Okay. Now, of interest to you is the energy changes that occur as your object oscillates. If you look at the next page, if you look at the graph of, say, Ke, 
versus displacement. Maybe it's better if I just label them. If you look at the graph of, say, Ke versus displacement, the graph of Ke versus displacement would look like this. Okay, which does make sense because you see, I mentioned to you here, Ke is max at equilibrium and then Ke is zero at amplitude. So your graph looks like that. Then if you move on to EPE versus displacement, your graph shape looks like this now. Okay. So as mentioned to you, EPE is going to be zero at equilibrium because displacement is uh, zero in the first place. But then at amplitude, EPE is max at amplitude okay so this is your graph for ke and epe versus displacement now if we ask you about the total energy e total versus displacement your total energy with displacement would just be constant throughout okay it will be constant throughout assuming that there are no energy losses now the total energy is going to be constant throughout, okay? The relation that you should know here is that your E total is actually the sum of your Ke plus EPE, okay? So this one by right remains constant. So you can have a case where Ke increase, EP drops, or Ke drops, but Ep increase. But the thing is that E total remains constant, okay, throughout. So all these graphs, if you combine them together, you're going to get the last graph, okay? The last graph here is actually kind of telling you that your total energy here is actually the sum of your Ke and Ep add together. So you add up your Ke and Ep at any particular displacement, it by right should get you back the total energy. Okay, so that's what you're supposed to kind of know from here. All right, then last thing to note is if we ask you to plot a graph of energy versus time, okay, if we ask you to plot a graph of say energy versus time, it will be a sinusoidal graph to okay. For Ke, it will be this dotted line here that is highlighted in orange. For Pe, it will be this blue line here, the solid line. Your total energy is this horizontal line here. So as I mentioned to you, your total energy is fixed throughout. It's constant throughout, so it's just a horizontal line. But your EP and K can change, all right? Now, of interest to you is sometimes when they ask you to find the period from your energy time graph. Now, this is where you need to be a bit careful because, you see, if I give you a graph of, say, displacement versus time, that looks like this. And then I ask you to find out the period for me. This one, you will easily say, oh, this one is the period. That is correct. No issues here. But you look at your graphs carefully. This is not displacement versus time. This is it's not a displacement time graph. It's actually an energy time graph. So if you're talking about energy time graph, there is a tendency for people to say that if I just look at the, e, the EPE portion, there's a tendency for people to say that all oh, from here all the way to here, this one is actually my 
period because they are used to seeing this kind of graph shape and then saying, okay, that is one cycle, so it's one period. This one here for energy time graph, this one is actually not a period, okay? What is actually a period is actually you taking another same shape, then this one is actually your period. Okay, now in the first place, why can't I say that this one is actually my period? You look at your graphs and then you look at your diagram from before. So if I look at the diagram from before, if I started from here, I told you EPE is max. Then here EPE is zero. And then right over here, EPE is max again. So if this one was the energy versus time graph, and I plot the graph, this would be what I expect to see. This is where my EPE is max now, okay? So you see this one here, by right, is actually just supposed to be half a period because you see from here to here, this is really just half a period. I will need to go back from there all the way back to my original position in order for it to be considered a full period, right? I mean, if you look at the green color arrow here, from here, uh, negative amplitude to positive amplitude, this is actually another half period. It's only once I have these two that I get a full period, okay? So right now, if it's an energy versus time graph, this one is actually not period. It's actually half a period. Okay, that's why you see the diagram here. They actually kind of leave it for you already. This one is actually half a period. Okay. You need to make it go another round. Then it's considered to be a full period. So that is for this, all right? So I'll just clear this one off. Okay, then next one. We talk about the energy changes when something undergoes the slash M. You also require to know how to calculate out the energies when something undergoes slash M. So what can you use would be these equations listed on the table here. Now, if I want to find kinetic energy at a point for something that undergoes SHM, I can actually use back the equation for kinetic energy, which is half mb squared. Now, just now in the previous pages, I mentioned to you that something that undergoes SHM is velocity at any point is actually omega square root x naught square minus x squared. So if you were to just substitute v into half mv squared, you're actually going to get kinetic energy has half m omega square x naught square minus x squared. So this is kinetic energy at a point. Okay. Now, what if I want to find out total energy of oscillation? Now, just now I mentioned to you that total energy is actually Ke plus your EPE. This one by right remains constant. Then I say to you, if this one increase, I thought I say to you, if this one increase, sorry, I say to you that if your Ke is increasing, your EP must be dropping. And then if let's say your Ke is dropping, your EP must be increasing. Okay. There's also something that you can also kind of do from here. If I tell you that your Ke is max, your EPE will be zero. Or if your Ke is zero, that is where your EPE is max. Okay, either one of this. Or, but, or, but regardless of which situation you're talking about, your E total again remains constant. Now, if you want to have a better appreciation of what this means, you can again look back at the previous diagram for the mass on spin that is mounted horizontally. So you see, if I just look at this one at the amplitude position, this is where my EPE is max. 
and then ke is zero right the sum of these two is actually my e total then if i look at the equilibrium position which is this one ep is zero but ke is ke is max these two added up again is my e total okay so total energy is either your ke max or epe max but it's actually easier to just start with ke max okay because you already have an equation for ke max so you, sorry because you already have an equation for ke so total energy is actually ke max now i know ke will be maximum when displacement is zero meaning to say when you're at equilibrium position so all you just need to do is that you look at your original equation here you sub x squared as equals to zero so your resulting equation will be half m omega squared x naught squared this is your total energy okay so this is the second equation now next one you want to find out your elastic potential energy you have to make use of the first two equation that you found just now i mentioned to you that total energy is the sum of your ke plus pe so potential energy must therefore be total energy minus ke so you already found out the equations relevant to total energy and kinetic energy here you can actually say that epe is actually half m omega square x naught square minus with half m omega square x naught square minus x squared so you try to simplify the algebra you will see that this half m omega square x naught square will be cancelled by half m omega square x naught square so the only thing left remaining would be half m omega square x square all right that's why i can say to you that your nested potential energy is just half m omega square x, x squared all right so these three equations are actually the main things that you need main equation that you need to know when it concerns uh energy all right now the fourth one is actually trying to find total energy again but this one is based on your potential energy you're trying to find potential uh, your max total energy based on potential energy so as i mentioned to you earlier just now your total energy can also be your maximum elastic potential energy right but i know that my elastic potential energy is maximum when x is zero when you are at amplitude position so all you just need to do is that you substitute from ep half m omega square x square if you substitute x as x naught this is actually e ep max which is half m omega square x naught square which is in turn going to be equal to your k uh, which is in turn going to be equal to your total energy okay so you're going to get this all right from your equation for pe if you want to find total energy you just find the case where it is maximum that is where your x is x naught that's where you are amplitude you eventually will see that the equation that you are getting is actually the same as the equation that you got before okay so this one is actually the same as this one all right so these are the energy equations that you need to know before you can do your calculations for SHM. All right, you just need to know the first three that I show. Okay, the fourth one actually is the same as one of them. All right.